Turn with me to Luke chapter 11 this morning, and as you do, let's bow in a word of prayer. Our Father, thank you for your many blessings. Thank you, Father, for your kindness and your goodness and your grace. Lord, as we have been worshiping you by scripture reading, as we have been worshiping you in prayer already, as we have been worshiping you in song, now we worship you through the ministry of your word. And then I pray that as we leave, we will worship you with the life that we live. There's no end to worship. There's no act that we do or are involved in that cannot and should not be an act of worship, one that declares your worth. So help us to learn how to do that better and better and better and better for the glory. Our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray in his name. Amen. Or Luke chapter 11, we begin this morning. Some of you may remember, um, you might have to be a little older, I'm not sure, but remember the days when, there was, when, when the ignition switch had a key that was separate from the starter, right? So usually you had to s- turn the ignition key and then stamp on the starter for the truck or the car, or the tractor or whatever it was. And if you remember that, you may remember that you could push the starter without ever turning the key and the starter would turn the, mo- turn, turn the motor over. And if you just happened to have the car in gear, it would jerk forward a couple feet, right? And so you could actually make a little bit of progress just by pushing down on the starter without ever engaging the key. It wasn't very fun, and it didn't get you very far, but you could do that. Now, if you're like me, you may feel sometimes that the Christian life that you're living is a little bit like that, starting, stopping, kind of proceeding by what we used to call on the farm fits and spurts. I don't know where that term came from, but it fits pretty accurately, I think. That's the kind of progress we're making. And if so, I'd like to suggest that the problem almost certainly is that we haven't turned the key that would allow the engine to engage. What's the key? Prayer. Prayer is the key. Something that we talk so much about and do so little of. And yet without it, Beloved, without it, nothing that we do can be of eternal value. It may have a certain amount of worth here in this life. It may get a certain amount of claim. It may even be of a certain amount of of good to certain people, but it can't have eternal value without having prayer behind it. It's just wasted effort. Now, having said that, It takes more than prayer to live a Christian existence, to accomplish what the Lord is asking us to do here in this life and on this world, right? It takes action as well as prayer. When I was a youngster, I used to collect keys. One of the, you know, I had strange hobbies and that was one of them. I had these great key rings full of keys. They did me absolutely no good. I had no idea what they went to. You know, they were keys for cars or for houses or for locks that I picked up here and there. A great collection of keys, but they were absolutely useless. Didn't know what they went to. So there must be in a Christian life and in a Christian existence, prayer has to be accompanied by action. But, there's a, there's a large but here, but prayer is by far... <clears throat> by far the most important piece of that duel. Yes, there must be action, either on our part or eventually on someone else's, but prayer is far and away the most important piece. And yet, for most of us, it's the thing that goes last, if it goes at all. I want you, by the end of this series, to know this phrase I'm going to give you now. John Bunyan said it. He said, 
You can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you can't do more than pray until you've prayed. Let me repeat it. You can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you can do no more than pray until you've prayed. What he's saying is what the Bible teaches throughout, that prayer is at the basis of everything. And beloved, if we would get that right, if we really caught on to that, it changes your existence. I promise you, it changes your existence. One of the disciples of Jesus got it. And so he came to Jesus in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, and he said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray. This was a man who had been following Jesus and he had been watching closely. And what he saw was that when Jesus prayed, things happened. And so he wanted to begin to get this power into his life. And he said, Lord, teach us to pray. Interestingly enough, this is the only place in the Bible where somebody asked Jesus to teach them something. Now, obviously, he was teaching them the word of God on a daily basis as they went along. But this man was seeing there must be something to this prayer. And his question spotlights the importance of prayer. And so Jesus takes some time to teach his disciples about this. Now, as we begin this series, and we're going to camp here for a while. We're going to camp here for a while because, beloved, we, we have a wonderful church. A lot of great things are happening in our church. I can see the Holy Spirit moving. But if there's a, if there's a weak point in our church, if there's an Achilles heel of our life together, it's this. We do not pray enough. We're not what I would call a praying church, and we need to be. How much more could we be accomplishing if we were praying not only individually, but corporately, together, fellowshipping around prayer? So I hope as we study this, we will find that it's important to learn about prayer, but it's far more important to do prayer. Far more important to do prayer. So even as we are learning, if you're already praying, I hope you will be incentivized to pray more. If you're not praying or it's very little, I hope you'll be incentivized to get started, to see that prayer is everything. Don't wait until you've learned it all. Pray as you go. You know, it's, 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 like, learning how to, it's like learning how to shoot an M16 rifle. I don't know how many of you have ever picked one of those up and shot it, but if you do, you know that the first time you pick it up and pull the trigger, you're not going to hit much. The power of that weapon is difficult to control. It takes practice. But if the enemy's coming over the hill, you don't get out the instruction book and start doing, right? You pull the trigger and start shooting. And what I want you to know, beloved, is that the enemy is coming over the hill. And so we need to be pulling the trigger. We need to be praying. If we don't get it perfectly, if we don't get it all just right, we need to be praying. We need to learn as you go. This is on-the-job training. And I pray that as we look at this passage of Scripture over the next few weeks, we will be mightily encouraged not to get smart about prayer, but to do prayer. Now, eventually, we're going to look at what Jesus teaches the disciples here in detail but I want to take a couple of weeks just to look at some general observations about prayer from this passage of Scripture. A couple of weeks just to look at general observations. So number one general observation. Prayer is entree to God, not to self. Prayer is entree to God, not to self. Marine biologist was partying with some friends and he was telling them a little bit about his research. He said, Did you, you guys probably don't know this, but some whales can communicate at a distance of 300 miles. Of course, one of the guys said, 300 miles? He said, what would one whale say to another 300 miles away? <laughs> Naturally, there was a smart aleck in the crowd, right? And he said, well, he's probably saying something like, can you hear me now? <laughs> can you hear me now? Can God hear us now, beloved? 
as far away as he may be? The answer is incredibly yes. He can hear us now. It doesn't matter the distance. It doesn't matter the issue. It doesn't matter the problem. God hears us. We've lost our amazement at that incredible fact that God hears us. Look at verse 2. It says, And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father. I mean, stop right there. Here in the, is the most wonderful aspect of prayer. Prayer is access to God. Prayer is me talking to God. Prayer puts us in the Creator's presence. And here I am talking to Him, and more than that, He's listening. And here's the thing that we, that we so easily forget, which is that we have absolutely no business being there. None. We're as out of place when we are talking to God, entering his throne room, as if somebody picked us up and transported us, you know, into the presence of the Queen of England or the President of the United States. Well, how would we feel? Somebody picks you up and takes you there. What's the first thing you're gonna think? I'm not dressed right. I don't know the protocol. I don't know what to say. What if somebody asked me a question? We're out of our league and and we know that. And here we come into the presence of God, into the throne room of the creator of everything. And I, you know, the question is, where is the awe and where is the respect and where is the reverence? And where is the sense of privilege that we get to come into his presence? We've forgotten who God is and who we are. God is perfect in his Holiness, for one thing. That means a couple of things. It means, number one, God is totally other than we are. He's transcendent. We understand him because he accommodates himself to our language, right? Because he gives us words that we can understand so that we can get at least a little bit of a glimpse of him, but he's totally other. The second thing that means that God is holy is that he is that he has a moral perfection that is absolute. There is no break in the moral perfection of God. There is no flaw. There's no, you know, there, there's no flaw in the armor there. He is absolutely perfect. And we don't realize how absolutely rotten we look compared to his perfection. We've forgotten that. You know, we get a little bit of a reminder, a passage like Isaiah 64, 6, where he reminds us that our righteousness is like filthy rags, a polluted garment. Do you ever consider what that really means? You know, you know what that means? That means that on our best day, on our best day, on the day you get up happy, and the day that you... Do your devotions and you pray right away. And your prayer isn't just for yourself, it's for a lot of other people. And, and the day you give money and effort to help the people that are victims of the latest flood and you've actually went down and mucked out houses. On the day when you come home and your wife says something that's really irritating and you respond with patience and kindness. On that day... Your righteousness is like a dirty, oily, sewage-laden rag on that day. Whoa. Say, well, that's a wonderful reminder. That's just what I needed to come to church to hear. Listen, beloved, I'm not telling us this to bury us. What's the point? The point is that we get an understanding of reality here, right? This is who we are doesn't mean we shouldn't do those things. Of course we should do those things. But it means that God, on our best day, sees that our motives are mixed. And in addition to the whatever it may be that's of value and that's good there, he sees the selfish motivation behind it. He sees the self-righteousness that attaches to it because I got it right. Thereby negating whatever it was I got right. 
God sees through all of that. And the point is, not to bury us, but to let us understand we can never deserve to be in his presence. Never. It's not possible. So why are we there? Why are we there? Because, beloved, we have a mediator. Because we have a mediator. We have a go-between. We have somebody who can represent us to God and who can represent God to us and somebody who can go before us and say, this person, this person gets entrance, not because of who they are, but because of who I am. I'm the mediator. This is what Paul reminds us that Jesus does in 1 Timothy 2, verse 5. When he says this, he says, For there is one God, and there is one mediator. Don't miss, there's one God only, and there's one mediator only. There's one God, and there's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Why are we in the presence of God? Jesus is our ticket, beloved. Jesus is the one who has paid the entrance fee with his own blood through his death on the cross by which he made available salvation for us because he paid the penalty for sin there. Therefore, we can come into the presence of God and not be incinerated by his holiness, which the Bible assures us is like a consuming fire. We have a mediator. Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16 say it this way, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We could never earn that right, could never do enough, not on our best day, but in Christ we have access. Pete Briscoe, Pete Briscoe pastors the church where my sister Debbie goes down in Dallas area. I'm actually reading a biography of his parents right now, Stuart Briscoe and his wife, Jill. Some of you may have read some of their books and so on. Stuart, a British man who has retained his accent, but he pastored a, a church in Milwaukee for about 30 years. So that's where Pete grew up. And Pete says, in, you, you gotta real, realize what it's like in Milwaukee. In Milwaukee, the brewers are like gods. And so he says, everybody follows the brewers. Everybody watches them on TV, listens to them on the radio. And he said, as many as can make a pilgrimage to County Stadium to worship in person as often as possible. But he said, when you go there to County Stadium, you'll find that you, you, you may get access by paying the ticket to the stands, but you don't get to the locker room that's the inner sanctum. That's the holy of holies. You can't go there. No mortal fan can just walk in there. But one day, Pete got access. Pete was allowed to go into the locker room. Pete was allowed to speak to the players that were there. Pete was allowed to share the gospel with those people. Why? How did he, a common everyday fan of the Brewers, get into the locker room because he knew Paul Molitor, the Hall of Fame captain of the team at the time. And Paul Molitor arranged for him to come in. He gained entree because of his relationship with Paul Molitor. It raised him to a different level. It elevated him to the point where he could come in and he could share in this way. He had a mediator. And that's what Jesus Christ is for us, a mediator who gives us instant access, instant access to the presence of God, to a place where we otherwise could never be. And so we have no greater privilege in this life than instant access to God through Christ. So let me ask, are you using the access? Are you? How foolish could we be if we're not doing this? Have we been there lately? 
Or are we squandering this most wonderful and amazing of gifts that God has given us? You know, the skeptics are quick to say, prayer, prayer is nice, good psychological tool. If prayer helps you, if you need that crutch, usually said with a mocking tone, then go ahead and pray. If it makes you feel better, great. At best, at best, it may help you to get a little more in touch with the inner you and to find the strength that lies within and tap into that power. Beloved, that's not even close to how Jesus represents prayer. He's not talking about tapping into the power within me. He's talking about tapping into the power of the creator of the universe outside of myself because of the work of Jesus Christ. That's a totally different thing. Prayer is entree to God. It's not entree to myself. And what a privilege we have. This is a place that we could never go on our own to make appeals that we could never deserve because we have a mediator. Can you see what fools we would be not to take advantage of what, of what we have in him at such great price by him? You know, if... If prayer, beloved, is a foreign land to you this morning, let me urge you, get in the game. Prayer is access to the greatest territory in the universe. Absolutely forbidden to us, except for the work and person of Jesus Christ. So don't squander it. Don't let it go. We need to be there. Entree to the Father. Secondly, prayer is essential. It's not optional. Say, are you saying I can't live without prayer? No, I'm saying you can't live a Christian life without prayer. Sure, you can live without prayer. But don't ever fool yourself that you're living a Christian life without prayer. You're not. Good things may happen to you, Certain things that you thought, hey, this is the blessing of God may actually be true. There's such a thing as common grace. God says he makes his rain come on the, on the, the, the believers and unbelievers alike. But you're not living a Christian existence unless you're being with the Father. You're not. Prayer is not optional. It's essential. So why is it essential? So we can go there and get things? So we can tap into the great Santa Claus in the sky? For most people, that's what they think when they think prayer. Now listen, by the end of this series, if you don't have that straightened out in your mind, I have totally failed. The Holy Spirit could not possibly fail, so it would have to be my failure. But failure it would be. Prayer is not about getting things. Prayer is about one thing, beloved. It's about aligning with the will of God. Prayer is about aligning with with the will of God. And you see, when we're aligned with the will of God, all those other things will come. But they will come in the right way. And they will come as and when that's what God wants to have happen. Prayer is aligning with the one and only will in the universe that counts. The one and only will in the universe that gives perfection to life and to death and to everything else. Your best life is not what you will. I know you think so. I think so. We all tend to think, I know what's best for me. We don't. So when we pray for things without submission to the will of God, we're just kidding ourselves. Prayer is always about aligning with the will of God, and you will never understand prayer until you get that. You won't. You'll be praying and saying, how come I'm not getting my answer? I give up. God is not there. He's the, he may be good for other people. He's no good for me. It's because you don't understand what prayer is. Prayer is about aligning with the will of God. Now listen, I want to show you how important this is. Look at verse 1. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. Who was praying? Jesus. Now think about that for a moment. Jesus, God in the flesh, is praying. 
Think how much this characterizes the lifestyle and the ministry of Jesus Christ. And let me show you some of this. Let's start in Luke. Just turn back to chapter 3, Luke 3. At the very beginning of his public ministry. In Luke chapter 3 and verse 21. At his baptism. Luke 3 verse 21. It says, Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heavens opened. Even as he entered the waters of baptism to initiate his ministry, Jesus was praying. And in response to his prayer, what happened? <laughs> All of heaven opened. As Jesus prayed, heaven opened. The Holy Spirit descended in a visible form, in the form of a dove, so everybody could see what was going on, understand what was going on. The voice of God, the Father, was heard, saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. When Jesus prayed, things happened. But he was seeking the will of God. And when Jesus prayed, that's what happened. And he prayed a lot. He prayed at the end of his ministry. Turn with me to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24. Just go to the end of the book. And just prior to his ascension, his departure from this planet, here's what we read. Luke chapter 24 and verse 50. Luke 24 verse 50. Then he led them, it's his disciples, he led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. The last thing that Jesus did on earth was to pray. And in response to his prayer for blessing, he was taken back up into heaven. Now you say, well, wait a minute, I don't see any connection there. He was taken back up into heaven because the father was saying, okay, mission's done, come on back. Really? I don't think so. What's Jesus praying for here? He's praying for the blessing of his disciples, right? Previous to this, he had told them what the blessing would consist of. It's in John 16 and verse 7 where Jesus said this. He said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage. Now think about this. It's to your advantage that I go away. If Jesus was sitting right here on the platform this morning and you were going to have access to come up and talk to him afterwards and he was going to go home with you for lunch and he was going to be with you for the next week, would you agree if he said it's to my advantage, that it's to your advantage that I go away? I mean, come on. But that's what he's telling his disciples. As great as it's been for you to have me with you, that's wonderful, but I got something better. It's to your advantage, he says in John 16, 7. It's to your advantage that I go away. Why? For if I do not go away, the Holy Spirit will not come to you, the helper. But if I go, I will send him to you. So that's the backdrop to Luke 24, verse 50, where Jesus is now praying for the blessing of his disciples. And what's that blessing? That the Holy Spirit's gonna come, which means that if they're gonna be blessed, the Holy Spirit must come, which means that he must go away, and he's, he's praying for the blessing of the disciples, and those are the things that have to happen. Guess what? Those are the things exactly that happen. It's an answer to prayer. So Jesus prays at the beginning of his ministry. He prays at the end of his ministry. And believe me, prayer marked everything in between, right? Every critical moment in his ministry. In the book of Mark, in the first chapter of Mark, Jesus is seen healing people late into the evening, early in his ministry, late into the evening. And then in Mark 1.35, we're told this, and rising very early in the morning while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place and there he prayed. And guess what? In answer to that prayer, when they came to seek him to come back to the healing service, he left. You're kidding me, right? People that are in wheelchairs and people that are crippled 
and people that can't see and people that are deaf are right outside the door just waiting for healing and Jesus leaves. Why? Because he's aligning with the will of the Father and there's something more important than that physical healing. What's he going to go do? He's going to go preach in other cities. He said, that's more important. I got to go. The will of the Father is driving him. His compassion alone would have let him stay, stay there. But he leaves because his prayer has aligned him with the will of the Father. Now, that's not the end of that kind of thing. In Luke chapter 5, verse 15, Luke 5, verse 15, we see this. It says, but even now even more... The report about him went abroad and great crowds gathered to hear him and to be healed of their infirmities, but he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. So now he's leaving not only the healing ministry, but he's leaving even the preaching ministry to be in a desolate place to pray to the Father so it could align with the will of the Father. You look at the book of John and over and over and over again, what's the burden of the heart of Christ? That I might do the will of him who sent me, that I might do the will of the Father, that I might do the will of him who sent me. That's all he cares about. Everything else was secondary. Jesus prayed all night, the night before he chose 12 apostles. Why? Because he wanted to align with the will of the Father. He prayed before he took five loaves and two fish to feed 5,000 people. Why? To align with the will of the Father. Jesus prayed prior to walking on the water to align with the will of the Father. Jesus prayed when they brought children to him, illustrating the value of those children aligning with the will of the Father. He prayed on the Mount of Transfiguration when his glory and his deity shone through for his disciples to see for the one and only time while he was here on this earth. Why? To align with the will of the Father at that point in time. And when he was in Gethsemane and he was face to face with the reality that he was about to take the sin of the world on himself and it was crushing him, he prayed, why? To align with the will of the Father. There's nothing in his humanity that wanted to go to the cross. In fact, his prayer was, Lord, if there's any way that this cup can be taken away, please do. But what was his submission? Not my will, but yours be done. He's praying to align with the will of the Father, and you can't miss the implication, can you? If Jesus needed to pray like this, to align with the will of the Father, what are we going to have to do? We're going to have to pray, right? Prayer is essential. Prayer is not a matter in the Christian life of you can if you want to or if you have time or it's okay if the opportunity is there. Prayer is essential. What did we see last week in the story of Mary Martin? Listen, I don't usually ask you to do this, but if you, didn't, if you weren't here last week, if you didn't hear the sermon last week, get online and listen to it. It's pivotal to the book of Luke. It's pivotal to your Christian existence. There's one thing that's necessary to be with Jesus. There's a reason that Luke put this account right after the account of Mary and Martha because he's reinforcing the message that Jesus gave to Martha that Mary was doing the one thing in life that was really necessary, which was to be with Jesus. Prayer is not an option for those who want to live a Christian life. It's, you know what it's like? It's like spiritual breathing. It's like, how long can you live without, without, without breathing physically? Did you ever try that? I mean, you know, let's, I think I'll go a day without breathing. It's a lot of trouble. You wouldn't get very far, would you? That's what prayer is to a spiritual existence. And if you are not praying, or if you go days without prayer, if you go a long time in the middle without prayer, beloved, you're starving yourself of the resources that you need. You're missing the one thing that's necessary to the Christian life. Prayer is essential. It's not optional. R.A. Torrey is the old evangelist, you know, that 
founded the school I went to, Biola. He tells of a young, mich- young Englishman who inherited a lot of money when his father died. But he was young and he was, you know, impetuous. So he went to India because he thought he could get more for his dollar there and he squandered. He went through all of it, gambling, drinking, carousing, debauchery. He came back to England with just enough left to put down on the gambling table, you know, to take one final try to get back on his feet again. And unbelievably, he won enough to get himself back on his feet, but within a few days, that was gone. So he was in desperation, and his sister came to one of Tori's meetings just about that time, and she asked Tori if he would pray for her brother. Neither of them knew that at the same time she was asking him to pray at the very time in Birmingham, England. That young man was 140 miles away in their hometown sitting with a loaded gun to his head about to take his own life. Now the interesting thing is about that particular prayer, the prayer went up in Birmingham, the answer came down 140 miles away in whatever the name of the town was in the form of memories of family Memories of a praying mother and that young man came to his senses even as he was sitting there and instead of taking his life by his own hand, he gave his life to Jesus Christ and turned his life around. Now, beloved, not every prayer is answered that quickly or in that way. God may sometimes say yes, he may sometimes say no. A lot of times he says, wait, a lot of times. But you, when you pray, are in the presence of the one who created everything. You're in the presence of the one who knows everything. And you are in the presence of the one who can do anything. Even stop a guy from taking his own life from 140 miles away. There's nothing he can't do. But here's the thing, if you're not, and and will he always do exactly what you ask? Probably not, but here's what you can't know. You can't know the will of God if you're not praying in some way. You can't know. If the business failed, or the accident happened, or the child got sick, you can't know if that was your failure or if that's in the will of the loving, omnipotent Father, unless you're praying. You can't know that. Prayer is aligning with the will of God. It's the the most wonderful place in the whole universe to be. Turn with me to Psalm 90. Look at this. This is a great, great verse. Psalm 90. It's a psalm Moses wrote. Do you know there was a psalm Moses wrote? We always think of David in the psalms, right? But here's one that Moses wrote. Got collected with the rest of them. It's a psalm where he urges us to number our days. So it's a psalm about having an eternal perspective. It's a psalm about living from God's perspective instead of my kind of earthbound perspective. It's a psalm about getting the bird's eye view. And look what he says in the last verse, Psalm 90, verse 17. Moses closes by saying this, let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Now, if you happen to have a New American Standard Bible, you'll have a a marginal note there that says that the word establish could be translated make permanent. Make permanent. What Moses is praying and thereby urging us to pray is that God would take the mundane things that we do every day of our life and that God would establish them in the sense of making them permanent. He's not saying establish them for the next you know, couple of days while something has to happen or for the next month or for the next three years. He's saying, will you please give eternal worth and value to this thing I'm doing. Think about that. That means that there's not a single thing that we do 
that we can't be asking God, please give eternal significance to washing these dishes. Give eternal significance to this phone call I'm about to take. Give eternal significance to this preparation I'm doing to go teach those unruly kids. Give eternal significance to my life. Don't let me live a wasted life. Don't let me live a life that's only, that's only good for whatever it can accomplish in the little bit of time I have here. Give eternal significance. It's on us whether we're going to do that or not. It's not on God. He's willing. He's ready. He's able. The question is, where are we? Let me close with this. Let me close just by urging us, don't squander the opportunity to come into the presence of the Father. Beloved, prayer takes us to breathtaking heights into forbidden territory where we have no right to be. And yet we can be there because we have a mediator who has invited us to come in his name. That's what it means, by the way, to come in the name of Christ. That's not a magical formula that you attach to the end of the prayer. In his name means I'm coming because of what he did, because of the righteousness that he's imputed to me. I'm coming. Life takes a whole different perspective when you begin to pray to pray specifically. The October 2011 issue of Christianity Today magazine had an interesting article that told about a family who were facing financial shortfall one month. (laughs) Could be any family, right? But the woman, knowing this was serious, they began to pray. And they were doing everything that they knew. The action was there, but they began to pray that the Lord would work. And three days later, an unexpected check arrived in the mail. I know this always happens to somebody else, not to you, right? I hope you haven't quit asking. I hope you'll tell me when this happens, because it will. It's the same Lord. The check came in the exact amount that they needed, and she said this. Here, Here... This, this, this is a woman after my own heart. She said, my skeptical mind knew the money could have been purely coincidental. But in that instance, I had the unprovable but resolute sense that it was God's answer to my prayer. I was, of course, flooded with immediate gratitude, but within minutes I was undergoing mental gymnastics. What if I hadn't prayed? I wondered, would God have provided anyway? Do I really have to ask when he knows our needs before we do? She goes on. I don't generally hear the audible voice of God, but that particular afternoon I could have sworn I heard a chuckle. Of course I would have provided it. It seems God was saying, but you wouldn't have had the joy of knowing it was me. That's true. You can't know anything as the Lord if you haven't asked, if you haven't been there, if you haven't brought yourself into his presence. You don't know if the bad thing happened because you failed. You don't know if the good thing happened because God provided or it was just common grace. Come to the throne of grace, beloved. That's the only place you can know that you and God are working together. This isn't, we need times for prayers, we'll see, but this is a lifestyle. This is, this, is a, this is living in the presence of God. Since he never leaves you nor forsakes you, you can talk to him anytime, anywhere, short, long, eyes closed, eyes open, in your mind, with your mouth. But here's the thing that's most important. You can do more than pray after you pray. But you can't do more than pray until you pray, right? Let's pray. Father, somehow bring this bring this lesson home to us. It's just at the start of this series, there's nothing more important than we learn that prayer is entree to you and that it's essential, it's not optional. And so 
Lord, as awkward as it may feel if we're not used to talking to you or as, as oh, what's the word, Lord? As, 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 as hopeless as it seems sometimes when the answer doesn't come right away or when the answer isn't what we thought it should be. Lord, help us in those times to more than ever grasp onto you and cling to you and say thank you for providing what I really needed instead of what I thought I needed. That's the essence of trust. Easy to trust you, Lord, when, when we get everything just like we thought we should. The hard part is when it doesn't quite come that way. But then then our, test is, our faith is put to the test of, do you really believe God or do you just believe you? Help us to believe God. Thank you for the challenge, Lord. Help us to be up to it, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.